How are you this morning? Doing good. Good. It's good. To good though that you got it. It's on. It was. You asked for it.
morning. Good morning. We come together to sort of feed off each other and let our praise rise to the Lord. There we go. Rise to the Lord and so that his blessing can rain down upon us. Let it rise. Stand and sing with us if you're able. Oh, wait, can I say a little something? What? Ren pointed out that in our bulletins, it still says, and I, just, I think this is an oversight, I could be wrong, but it still says, only sing if you have your mask on. And so, I don't know, do you know? Is that still the truth anymore? I don't think that's really so. So, we're, we're thinking it, it, we can sing. You don't yeah. have to wear your mask. So, um, yeah, you, you can. Oh boy, so you might want to stand up on this one. Yep. Oh boy. Next song is our theme song for this Sunday, Sanctuary.
105th Psalm. Alleluia, give thanks to Yahweh. And call on God's name, proclaim God's deeds among the people, sing to God, sing praise, and tell of all God's marvels. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts that seek Yahweh rejoice. Turn to Yahweh, to God's strength, and seek God's presence constantly. Remember the marvels God has done, the wonders performed and the judgments pronounced, you descendants of Sarah and Abraham's, God's faithful ones, you offspring of Leah, Rachel, and Jacob, whom God chooses. Yahweh is our God, whose authority covers all the earth. Let us pray. God, work in us, through us, and among us to prepare us to be a place where you are known, a people through whom your love is proclaimed and through whom your grace is made real. All this we ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. As we gather, you, yeah, you can go sit down now. We're not going to sing for a bit. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to La Scottish United Methodist Church. We are a reconciling congregation, which means we welcome all peoples uh, as Christ did, regardless of age, race, gender, sexual orientation, cultural background, physical or mental health, family status, or financial circumstances. We welcome all persons into the full participation in the life and ministry of this congregation, for this is God's house, not ours. And to this table, all are invited and all are welcome, for this table is set by God and welcomes all. So welcome to this, the house of God, this house of prayer. As we gather this morning a few things about our life together, want to remind you that the choir is back in session and they gather on Wednesday nights to rehearse. And if you'd like to know more about the choir, speak with David, the man waving his hand over there. Um, he'll be happy to talk with you about that. Um, there's always room for more to sing in the choir. Also would remind you that um, next Sunday is the Hunger Challenge Bags, and that will um, be in the, in the narthex, and that will, help, uh, collect, that will help the Silicon Valley Food Bank. So please note that as well. We do still need volunteers for our AV technicians, for ushers, as well as um, those who are willing to help be liturgists. Speak with Gail, who's up here in the front um, and if you're on, joining us online this morning, please go ahead and put your uh, prayer requests in the comments if you're on Facebook, and we can get those, uh, to, those will be gotten to me toward the end of the service when we collect the connections cards, um, and that'll be done when we sing, we, um, we are an offering toward the end of the service. So you can have a look at those as well. Um, would also remind you that uh, we have a, Jackets and jack-o'-lanterns coat drive, and Ursula, where are you? Come tell us about this, would you please? 
This is a joint effort through our church and Grace Preschool. And Ursula, tell us about that, would you? Well, you probably noticed that you have a flyer in your, in your um, bulletin, and then also I put a box out in the back uh, to collect the jackets, gently used jackets and coats for a family shelter, and they're also this year collecting pillows. If you have clean pillows that you don't need anymore or want to donate, you can put them in the back, and also family-sized shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. And the lady um, from the family shelter told me that when the families move out, they give them a bag with this stuff to take home. So thank you so much. And this is going on all through October. Thank you, Ursula. Would also remind you that this coming Wednesday is the start of the pastor's class, the fourth Wednesday of the month. And we're going to be looking at the first section of this book, Kingdom, Judge, Kingdom Grace Judgment by Robert Capon. Um, I would recommend it to you. I can tell you this, he's one of the few biblical scholars that makes me laugh out loud genuinely, because he's actually very funny. Um, so it's a very accessible book, a very accessible read. Um, would highly recommend it to you and encourage you to join me on, that, uh, on those fourth Wednesdays. I think those are the announcements that need to come before us this morning. Oh, do want to remind you um, that yesterday we did have a gathering uh, pl about planning and vision and a conversation about that yesterday. Um, a group of us gathered across the way in the social hall. We'll be gathering again on the fourth Saturday in October. There are some handouts that uh, you can pick up from yesterday if you'd like. And we had a conversation that I would encourage you, if, if you weren't there, talk to those who were, find out who they were. There were about a dozen of us. And it was a good conversation where we looked at where we are, what our resources are available, what challenges are in front of us, but also we looked at opportunities as well as we, dream, we were able to dream a little bit about where we think we can go. So I would encourage you to join us next time if you're able on that fourth Saturday in October, and there will be more conversations in the future. So these aren't the last, these are just the beginning. So I wanted to give you that bit of report. And then finally, do, do want to remind you of this, this coming Friday, the 29th, want to remind you, join us for the Los Gatos High School football game. We're going to go in mass to support our kids over across the way to the, to the, at the high school. So wear your colors, go cats, right? <laughs> and we're going to go show our support over at the high school for our neighbors and our kids. So this coming, this coming Friday, let's go to the high school. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of young Christians, but I'll read the story to you anyway, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> this will be easier. We're all we are. <laughs> so this is the story that you're going to hear in a little bit. Oh, no, there, here we go. Come here. <laughs> I didn't see you back there. You want, to, you want the story before you go into Sunday school? No? Okay. You, 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 you can be shy. It's okay. So, in the Spark Story Bible, it tells the story of the manna, the quail, and water. It says, God loved the Israelites and their leader Moses, and God promised to bring the people to a place where they could build homes and live happily. They'd never lived outside of Egypt before, and they were afraid. But God went with them as they walked long and far to the place God promised. Traveling was hard and tiring along the way. The people became hungry. Maybe we would even say hangry. They complained to Moses, I'm so hungry, one boy cried. I wish we could go back to Egypt, whined a little girl. At least we had food to eat there, her stomach growled. The people missed their dinners of meat and bread. The Israelites didn't know what, that God had heard them complaining. That evening, something strange happened. Tiny birds called quails appeared everywhere. God had sent the quails so the people could eat meat. The next morning, the ground glistened with fresh dew. Even after the sun dried up the dew, there was still something covering the ground. It looked like bread had rained down from heaven. It was manna. The manna 
looked like tiny seeds and tasted like bread. The people ate and ate. Every day God sent manna and quail so that the people had food to eat. The Israelites kept traveling toward the place God promised. After a while they ran out of water. Even though God had given them food when they were hungry, the people still complained. My mouth feels dry like a desert, sobbed a child. The people were thirsty. This time God told Moses to hit a rock with his staff. When he did, water gushed out of the rock. The people had more than enough to drink. God gave food and water to the Israelites every day. God took care of the people just like God promised. Now, if you're going off to Sunday school, I would send you off with this. God's looking after us, even when we don't realize it. Just remember that. In the little ways, God is looking after us. And we'd fold our hands and we'd pray. And here's what we'd pray. Thank you, God, that you look after us in the little things every day. By the people who love us and the people who care for us and in the ways we get to care for others. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Off to Sunday school you go. tall person must have been here before me. Good morning. Our scripture today is from Exodus 16, 2 through 15. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt there we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out into the desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instructions. On the sixth day, when, the measure, when they measure out what they have collected, it will be twice as much as they collected on another, in other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the Lord's glorious presence, because your complaints against the Lord have been heard. Who are we? Why blame us? Moses continued. The Lord will give you meat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning because the Lord heard the complaints you made against him. Who are we? Your complaints aren't against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole Israelite community, Come near to the Lord because he's heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned to look toward the desert. And just then, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses, I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have your fill of bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes as thin as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? They didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. Nice to have a backup man. Our second, <laughs> yep. 
Our second reading is from Matthew 20, 1 through 16. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After he agreed with the workers to pay them a denarian, he sent them into his vineyard. Then he went out around nine in the morning and saw others standing around the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. And they went. Again around noon and then at three in the afternoon, he did the same thing. Around five in the afternoon, he went and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you just standing around here doing nothing all day long? because nobody has hired us, they replied. He responded, you also go into the vineyard. Then evening came. The owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the workers and give them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and moving on finally to the first. When those who were hired at five in the afternoon came, each one received a denarian. Now when they're that those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarian. When they received it, they grumbled against the landowner. These who were hired last worked one hour and they received the same pay as we did, even though we had to work the whole day in the hot sun. But he replied to one of them, friend, I did you no wrong. Didn't I agree to pay you a denarian? Take what belongs to you and go. I want, to give, I want to give to this one who was hired last the same as I give to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you resentful because I'm generous? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This passage is in so many ways a consternation because it flies in the face of everything that we think things ought to be. It flies in the face of the way we think the world ought to work. But yet, here it stands. It stands here looking us in the face, and it, I don't know about you, but it makes me scratch my head. Because it's one of those texts that pushes our notions of what's just and what is justice. This text is a challenge to us because we have a notion of what justice is. But I want to step back just a little bit, just a wee bit, and I want to begin by looking first at that text from Exodus. The text from Exodus is a text which we learn in Sunday school often. I can remember learning it. I can remember being in second grade Sunday school and coloring the little pictures from David C. Cook of the quail coming in. I can remember that. Penny Moomy was sitting there leading our class in the basement of my home church. But I can also remember learning that story again in third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade. And every time I learned a little bit more about it and a little more depth about it. And what finally strikes me, what finally, what I took home from that story is that God cared for both those that we might call good and those we might judge to be bad. Everybody in the whole company of Israel received from God's provision. They received the quail. They received the manna. It didn't say only to some people did the quail and manna go. 
It went to all the people, regardless of who they were. It didn't say only to those who didn't grumble against God. It went to even those who grumbled against God. We often forget that, don't we? That God is providing in that story, not just for those who are in love and favor with God, those who want what God is leading them to, but God is providing even for those who are complaining against God and complaining against Moses. God's provision isn't, isn't, it doesn't require our consent one way or the other. God is providing, period. You see, that story tells us a whole lot about God, doesn't it? It tells us about a God who lays claim on our lives regardless of what we think of each other. A God who provides for us regardless of maybe even what we think of ourselves. And so often I think that gets in the way the most. We judge ourselves to be less than or to be in need of. I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've heard people say, oh, pastor, if I walked in the church, the roof would fall down. There'd be a lot of churches without roofs if that were the case. God can care for what God has provided. And God cares for each of us. There's nothing that God can't do for us. And there's no provision that God won't make. But then, how does that mesh, then, this provision for all, mesh with this story about the reign of God that we get from Matthew's gospel? If God is providing for good and bad alike, then what's that do with this story from Matthew's gospel? Well, it reminds us yet again that the way we maybe look at justice isn't exactly how God looks at it. One of the teachers in my background, uh, where he, he taught where I went to school, a guy by the name of Niebuhr said that justice was the closest approximation that we can get to the reign of God in human history, in human reality. That justice was the closest approximation that we can get to glimpsing what it looks like to live in the full reign of God but yet it's still just a glimpse of what God's reign looks like. It's not a complete expression of God's reign. And so here Jesus points to God's reign. God points, Jesus points to what it's like. And here it's a story that flies in the face of what some of us might expect. If I've been hired at first thing in the morning, daybreak, and I've worked all day, and then there's other folks who have been hired eight hours, ten hours later. Oh, and they're getting paid the same that I was promised. Well, then I'm going to get more. Isn't that a reasonable expectation, maybe? Maybe? Yeah. But then to get the same pay as the, the, the one that was hired just an hour or two before the end of the day... We think, hey, how is that just? Don't we? And what's the response from the vineyard owner? The vineyard's owner is simple. His, res his response or her response is simple. Can I not do with what I have as I wish? Can I not be generous with my resources? And so it becomes this question about grace in the end. It becomes a question about how we look at God's grace in this world. Finally, is God's grace enough? Is it enough? Do we think it's enough? Is it enough for me? Is it enough for you? Or do we 
think it has to be something more, that we somehow have to earn it. Isn't that what the first workers are saying? They didn't earn it. But what does the vineyard owner say? Can I not do with my love, mercy, and favor what I want? Because finally at the end, that's the treasure God has for us. Love, favor, and mercy. And would we be resentful of a God who gives that to each of us generously? If we're the one who's been hired at the last hour and we're given the same amount of grace that gives us entry into the reign of God, what do we think of those who were hired first that begrudge us having that entry? Or if we've been hired first and we've worked the whole life through in the grace of God, and yet those at the end come and receive it, just like we did at the beginning, do we begrudge those who come late? That finally is the question, isn't it? Do we begrudge God's mercy given freely and generously to all of us? You see, so often that becomes a conflict even in the church. And I think we see it even in our own denomination to this day in some of the things that are going on. But we can look around in our world and in our culture and we see it out there as well. But what does the reign of God look like? The reign of God looks like an owner who gives equally and welcomes the workers equally. That's a very different view of the world, isn't it? It's different than what we experience. And it's a call for us to live into the world differently than we do today. And to build a world that's different than we experience today. This is a passage which invites us to die to what we see as standards of success even. It invites us to let those parts of ourselves that want to even judge ourselves in comparison to others, to let those things die so that we might become alive to God and live more fully and completely to God. In 2012, at the end of the general conference in Tampa, Florida, I'm walking from the site of the convention center back to the hotel where the group that I'm staying, stay, working with is staying. It's about a mile and a half away. And I'm making the walk. And this is about a month and a month and a half after my heart attack. So this is my, my therapy. Is the mile and a half walk one way, a couple times a day. And I'm thinking to myself, what have I been doing for the last couple of weeks? What have I been doing? And on that walk, I made a pledge to myself that I was gonna give up the politics of our church and all of that stuff. Because I saw myself as contributing to part of the problem. It wasn't helping build the reign of God. It was helping build division. So I stepped away. Because you see, friends, helping build the reign of God is about walking hand in hand with each other. It's not about agreeing with each other. It's about standing in relationship with each other. It's about not being resentful of each other. It's about being generous of heart with each other and generous of spirit with each other. Being willing to listen to each other and being willing to struggle with each other even when it's hard. Since then, I've had some really 
long heart-to-heart -heart conversations with some former classmates. Some are in very different places on the spectrum than I am, and that's perfectly fine. And what I've discovered is those people that I came to love and appreciate 40 years ago now, I still love and appreciate to this day, even though we're not in the same places that we perhaps were when we were students. But they're still wonderful people. Can we get to that place in our society, in our churches, in our neighborhoods, where even though maybe we disagree on things, we can begin to love and appreciate each other for just the people that we are. That our neighbors are genuine, honest people who are our neighbors. They're living beside us. Maybe they come over in the middle of a storm and help us fix our roof. Or maybe they lend us the drill that we need to do whatever. Or maybe they look after our cat so that we can go. Can we begin to build that kind of community amongst ourselves and where we live? You see, that's part of what I think Jesus is pointing us toward. The reign of God is like a vineyard owner who gave generously and equally to all those who were hired. What if we lived that out as a congregation? What if that's how we loved as a congregation? Where everyone had that experience. Where we died to ourselves and lived to Christ. It's hard work. It really is. Because at the base, we're not that dissimilar from the children of Israel. We like to complain. I don't have enough this. I don't have enough that. We look at it from a position of scarcity. But what does God always come through with? Abundance. God provides if we'll but look. And what God provides is the love, grace, the love, mercy, and favor that we need. But can we give it away to our neighbors who need it too? Amen. Sing, You Who Are Thirsty. It's in one of those hymnals in the front. The black, the little black one, if you're curious. <laughs>
It's time to celebrate the gifts we have been given. God is generous to us. God's goodness and desire for goodness for us is never in question. It is the witness of scripture. As we pause to receive and to give this gift of music to the praise and glory of God, let our hearts grow full as we consider again how good God has been to us. As we come to this time of sharing joys and concerns and lifting our hearts in prayer, let me share with you those joys and concerns of which I am aware. Um, would ask your prayers this morning for uh, Pat and John Patterson, who are in need of our prayers for healing. Lord, in your mercy. We're seeking prayers this morning. This comes from Pete who's seeking prayers for four-year-old Amy, who's battling leukemia. Lord, in your mercy. We're asked to pray for a cousin, Jim, and his daughter, Christy, Chris uh, for health outcomes and uh, recoveries from upcoming surgery. This comes from Marna. Lord, in your mercy. Dixie asked us, asks us to offer prayers of gratitude for Patty Casper and her team for the amazing altar arrangements that she offers us week in and week out. Lord, in your mercy. We continue to pray for Pat Cartmill, Bill's mother, as she is improving slowly from her fractured hip. This comes to us from Johnny. Lord, in your mercy. Mary Beth asks us to pray for Mary Meyer. Lord, in your mercy. We're asked to pray for peace in Ukraine and Russia. Lord, in your mercy. 
We're asked to pray for Linda Gridley and Susan Trone, who are both recovering from COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy. We're asked to pray this day for those who are celebrating birthdays, particularly Carol and Bud Baker celebrating their youngest son's 49th birthday. Lord, in your mercy. We pray with thanksgiving and with hearts open and full for those without shelter and who participate in our shower ministry. Lord, in your mercy. We pray with thanksgiving for this first day of autumn. Lord, in your mercy. We pray this day with thankful hearts for the gift of the amazing music this morning. Lord, in your mercy. I ask your prayers this morning for those who are traveling. We have many in our congregation who are traveling this day. Lord, in your mercy. Would ask your prayers for Karen Alfred as she mourns and, and the family of Steve Allen as they mourn his death and we celebrated his life yesterday. Lord, in your mercy. Would ask your prayers for my family, for the death of Richard Carlton and Luann Carlton. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Gail is going to bring us news about the resolution of the trial of our bishop, Bishop Carcagna. So as many of you know, um, our bishop has been in trial because of some complaints against him, her. Um, Yesterday I was browsing the internet and As you know, on Google, you get all these news stories. Well, I've been looking in my email as your delegate to annual conference for any information because the trial was taking place. But there was a news story from from the press, and I read it, but then I went out to the conference website. Um, You can find out the details of her charges and all that on your own because there's not time for me to say that, but I will say... After three days of testimony and an evening spent in prayerful deliberation, a jury of Bishop Minerva Carcagno clergy peers found her not guilty of violating the United Methodist Book of Discipline on the four charges she faced. Um, I want to say thank you to, to Daniel because this kind of thing happens when the politics of the United Methodist Church, from what you said, it just really touched me because when people disagree about the book of discipline, the laws, this kind of thing will happen. So it says here, she will resume her Episcopal duties in the California Nevada Annual Conference and the United Methodist Connection. That'll happen on Tuesday. The Committee on Epicosopy is grateful for all the participants in the trial and their prayerful work. And we look forward to supporting Bishop Carcagno in her ministry going forward. There were a lot of people hurt by this. The people that brought the charges, Bishop Carcagno, the conference, and the whole United Methodist Church. Um, This is the first time in 100 years. 240. 240 years that the Methodist Church has put a clergy member on trial. A bishop on trial, yeah. Bishop, bishop on trial. So just continued prayers of healing for all those that are hurt by this. Um, so thank you. With grateful hearts for a just resolution for this matter, Lord, in your mercy. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Be of good courage and render to no one evil for evil. Lift up the faint-hearted. Rejoice always in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And how do we try to do that? We do no harm. We do good. We stay in love with God. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the one who has created us, the one who redeems us, and the one who sustains us day to day, be with us, be in us, and be among us, now and forevermore. Amen.